Hey, all right, welcome back. All right, this will be the first real lecture, and let's see how I can do for timing-wise on this. Um, so you've just read a little bit in the textbook about um, some of the ancient Greek influences, and I just wanted to take off from there uh, and talk about somebody that is not talked about in the textbook. In fact, a couple of figures um, who have an impact that continues to this day. Uh, and so it really relates to this notion of the relationship between psychology, science, and math. Uh, and in fact, we're going to have this question come up a couple times. I'm going to get to do another lecture on this from another angle in, in a bit. Um, but can psychology be a science? Here at University of Toronto Scarborough, if you um, complete your, your undergraduate in psychology, you get a bachelor's of science degree. And we certainly believe that psychology is a science. Uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit about why, and the reason I put it this way, can psychology be a science, is because this was really a question before the birth of psychology. Um, you know, a lot of, for many years, we were studying the world, um, you know, through physics, through chemistry, through uh, astronomy. We were looking out at the world and we were trying to understand it mathematically, but we weren't thinking of ourselves the same way. Um, why? Well, there's a few reasons why, uh, but one of the questions was, you know, is human behavior just so complex? Is it just something that can never be understood? And this is where math kind of comes in a little bit, because you see that over time, the ability to use math to represent something has been a very important step towards showing that that something is a science or can be thought of scientifically. So let's slowly get there. And let me start with this guy, Pythagoras. And by the way, Pythagoras is a fascinating guy. Um, I love Pythagoras because he and all his followers were vegetarian. I'm a vegetarian, by the way. I'm a vegan wannabe. I tr if it's not for cheese, I would be vegan, I swear. Um, and, and I'm working on it. Um, but Pythagoras, that was kind of interesting at his time um, to, to be that. Uh, but of course, what Pythagoras is really known for is his supposition that things in reality have some sort of mathematical order. Um, he talked a lot about mathematics and music, and I underline this only to say, if, you know, do some Google searching about uh, the mathematics of music. And, you know, there's fascinating things like if you play certain notes and notes are of just divisions of a string, different frequencies of vibration, but certain notes played together make us feel happy. Other notes make us feel sad. Uh, but ultimately, the notes are just mathematics. They are just frequencies of vibrations. Uh, but when you put these frequencies of vibrations together in the right way, it can produce certain emotional states in us. Um, and, and that's you know, kind of interesting. There is an underlying math to what makes music what it is. Of course, Pythagoras <clears throat> um, saw math everywhere. And so he's famous for his Pythagorean theorem, of course, where he said, you know, if you ever have a right angle triangle, any things that come together in a right angle triangle, he showed that there was this mathematical relationship that if you wanted to know how big the C side was over here, it will always be equal to this squared, the length of this squared plus the length of this squared, um, and that'll equal the length of C squared. And so then you then take the square root to get the actual length of C. Um, but he showed this to be true, uh, of, of, and nobody had done this before. Look, here's a right angle triangle. Look, it conforms to this mathematical structure. And people were like, whoa, you're really on to something, man. If you can get at the mathematical structure underneath something, you really understand it. And this is the, this is the sort of notion that became very, very strong uh, and a guiding influence to psychology, that there's an order to things in the universe, that you can capture this order through numbers. And when you do, that implies you're really on to something. You're really gaining an understanding. Okay, now we've seen the power of this sort of mentality, uh, especially with Isaac Newton and his laws of motion. So, of course, Isaac Newton wrote the Principia in 1687. And a lot of people think this was really when physics really became physics. You know why? People were interested in the world around them and had talked about it philosophically for, for many years. Well, when Newton specified the laws of motion, 
And he was able to, you know, especially law number two, um, the force that you must push on an object um, equals the, uh, sorry, the force acting on an object is equal to the mass of the object uh, times its acceleration. You know, when he started talking about things like acceleration and and the force you need to move a, a stable object and, and kind of boiled it all down to math, people were like, oh, okay he's got it and and of course you know he he basically set the model in the sciences that this is what we want to do this is where we want to get to okay cool um will we ever capture human behavior in a formula like this so i have a couple of responses to this i have my jokey kind of answer which by the way is the following <clears throat> you know we we, we talk a lot uh, about einstein with his e equals mc squared <clears throat> when you look at this formula, it's pretty freaking simple, right? It's the energy of something equals its mass, what it weighs, times some constant squared. Uh, to understand the energy of, say, falling objects, you can, you can measure that really easily. To understand human behavior, there are so many variables that affect you and how you behave. You know, how, how well you've eaten, how well you slept, whether your boyfriend or girlfriend has broken up with you um, recently, how your relationship is with your parents, how many vitamins you're getting, are you exercising enough? I, I could go on and on and on. So many variables affect you that it is going to be a challenge in psychology to ever have simple formulas capturing simple things because there's nothing simple about humans. But there are times when we have been able to apply math and it has been very important, especially in the sort of pre-birth years of psychology. So what do I mean by the pre-birth years? The textbook will talk about Wundt and I'll come back and talk about Wundt too. And, and um, Wilhelm Wundt is the guy, and by the way, um, in German, W's are pronounced V's and V's are pronounced W's. Um, so Wilhelm Wundt uh, is like William Wundt is what it looks like, uh, but it's Wilhelm Wundt. Uh, he is who we consider the first psychologist. Um, but before Wilhelm Wundt and before we actually talked about psychology, there was another group of people called psychophysicists. And they kind of did this. They showed that we could try to understand the mental world like we could understand the external world. That is that we could use math and capture things in math. And that was really, really important for people to even start thinking of psychology potentially seriously as a science. So there's really two people I could have talked about here. And the, and the two people are talked about quite a bit. And they're Ernst Weber, uh, and there's another guy named Gustav Fechner. And they were around about the same time doing very similar stuff. I'm gonna focus on Weber um, here. Um, but just know that there was this other character doing the same kinds of things. So notice here we're in the, you know, he, Ernst Weber did his thing sort of mid 1800s, which is before the official um, birth, if you'll call it that, of psychology, you know, before we talked about anybody being a psychologist per se. Um, he used something called the just noticeable differences uh, procedure. Uh, one is the just noticeable differences. This shows a, a pair of apples. But in reality, what he originally did is he would have two weights um, and he would ask people to close their eyes or he would blindfold them and he would put one weight in one hand and another weight in the other hand. And he would ask them, which one is heavier? Which weight feels heavier? And so what he's trying to get at is our ability to mentally feel what's in the exterior world. But it's really, he's asking in your mind, right? Which, which feels heavier in your mind? And he would vary the weights. Uh, and what he found was, was something really interesting. Let's say you started with a pretty light weight here. Um, let's say 10 grams. Now when you put something in this other hand, obviously if it's 10 grams and both people are going to say, I don't, they feel the same to me. They are the same. But now what if we start making one a little heavier? Okay. And so let's say we make it 10.2 grams. They can't tell the difference. Feels the same. 10.4 feels the same. Let's say when we get to an 11 and a 10, people say, ah, 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 this is heavier. This is the just noticeable difference, the point where they can just notice the difference, right? That this one's a little heavier than that. And what was it? Well, it was one gram. It was one gram relative to 10 grams, right? When we started with a 10 gram, we needed one more gram to feel the difference. But what Weber showed is what if you started with a 20 gram one over here? 
how big would this one have to be before you notice the difference? Would it be 21? Is it just one gram? No. It turned out to be two grams. If this was 20, this was two grams. If this was 30, you needed 33 over here to feel the difference. If this was 40, you needed 44 to feel the difference. You noticing a pattern here? You always need 10% more than the original weight. There's a constant, some sort of constant in our mind. And as the, you know, sort of background or as the, as the weight of the original one gets bigger, we need more of a difference in order to detect that difference. But the critical thing is it follows a nice linear function. Uh, and this became known as Weber's law. Uh, the change of intensity that you need relative to some base intensity is a constant. So I gave you, you know, 10%, for example, that you always needed 10% more to detect the difference. But it followed this constant new. This is kind of like an Isaac Newton kind of thing. Uh, and it was very important in psychology. It, it showed that because, again, we're talking about, let's, let's, use, let's sort of decompose this word, psychophysics. Ernst is trying to do physics on the mind. Psych, psyche, soul, mind, you'll see these things are interchanged a little bit in the early days of psychology because they saw them as, as the same thing um, to some extent. So with Weber showing this constant, or what we call Weber's law or Weber's fraction sometimes, uh, it suggested, hey, the mind is also, let me go back to this. Oops. <laughs> oh my goodness. There it is. <laughs> there is an order to things in the universe, and that order can be captured. There's an order to things in the universe. It seems like there's an order to things in our internal universe as well. And maybe we can capture that order with numbers. And if we can, does that imply understanding? Okay. So that's the cool thing with Weber. Uh, let me give you just one other example of this to show how important this is in psychology. Weber was at least focused on the perception of differences, which is something people could kind of imagine, okay, maybe perception follows mathematical laws. Let me introduce you now to Hermann, Hermann von Eppinghaus. Hermann was interested in memory, human memory. You know, here he is, 1850, um, you know, sort of middle again, just, just around the, the early days of psychology. Um, Memory, what the heck is memory? They didn't really have any sense of what memory was. They knew we could bring back things from the past, but it was a very mysterious kind of approach. And yet Herman showed even it might follow some sort of mathematical um, laws. Here's how Herman did things. He was, he was really known as a fastidious procedure kind of guy, and that became part of psychology as well. That's one of his influences. So for example, he wanted to study memory, but he didn't want to study memory for things that had meaning. He thought that was, they were too rich. They would, they would mess up his studies. So he created so-called CVCs, constant vowel consonants, like this, J-O-S, G-E-Q. So he created these three letter stimuli that had no previous meaning. And he created a whole bunch of them, first of all. And then what do you do is you take a set, say 12, pull 12 randomly from the set he created. And then he would repeatedly go through those 12, trying to remember them all. And then you'd put them down and you'd write down if you could remember all 12. Um, and then you'd check. And if you didn't get them all right, he would go through them all again and try to remember and write them all down. Now, when he did get it right, then he, he did it again until he could write them all down right. So he wrote them all down, flipped them over, wrote them all down again, flipped them over. If he could do that twice without looking, then he said, okay, they are now in my mind. I know these 12. And then he waited. Let some time pass. And after some amount of time had passed, he said, okay, now let me try to remember those 12. Let me see how I do. So he tried to recall the items. Here's what he found. If he waited just 20 minutes, he was already only at 58%. He could only remember 58%. If he waited an hour, he's down to 44, etc. And you see. So what this has been called is the forgetting function. And it's a nice mathematical function. 
And it suggests that that information that he had in his mind and was accessible was somehow disappearing. And he was measuring forgetting in a very quantitative way and showing this function. So let me just say to you, by the way, this isn't the whole story. Um, what he found, because you've probably felt this way, you've gone into a course, you worked really hard, you studied, you wrote the exam, you walk out and you feel like, okay, it's all gone now. I've forgotten everything. What he found is it's not gone. It seems like it's gone. But in fact, if you have to relearn that list, you can learn it much quicker after you've already learned it once. So that first time learning, it took a long time, but then you can relearn quicker. So that suggests that even though you can't remember these things, you can't pull them out of your mind, they're still there somewhere. And you, if you re-strengthen them again, you can get them back. Um, so that's kind of the good news. Those courses you feel like you've forgotten, you haven't really forgotten them. It feels like you've forgotten them. But if you needed that information and you had to relearn it again, you would relearn it quick, which is cool. The bigger story from this perspective is these are some early um, psychological results that again suggested that the mind might work in principled ways that could be captured by mathematics. Um, and that was very important uh, in the early days of psychology to kind of fueling this notion that, that it could be a science. Cool. What about nowadays? Well, it's not often that people try to capture psychological things nowadays with, with formula, um, simple mathematics. In fact, most of us kind of going back to that previous thing I said, we believe that human behavior is just way too complicated to do that. But we are using artificial neural networks. So this looks like just a bunch of connected things. Um, it's, they are simulations of the brain. Uh, there are people building networks that, that work in the way we think the brain works as far as how it passes information, how it represents information. Uh, and, and they build these models, these simulations, which are kind of now the theories. They build in all their assumptions into these models and then they test these models. These models become computational theories. So there is certainly that level of mathematics going on in psychology and theorizing. It's much more complex than anything you'd see in physics. Um, well, I mean, you see some complex things in physics too, but this is all very complex. Uh, there is a lot of math underlying it. It's a really cool area. There aren't many psychologists that do it because some find that math um, a little too intimidating um, to do it. But, but it's a strong area. In fact, uh, AI is very strong nowadays and University of Toronto is very strong in, in AI. So it's worth kind of noticing that uh, AI being artificial intelligence, of course, and, and when we try to actually model the human mind. Um, so that's going on and that's kind of cool. I'll mention that for those of you guys that are into that. Um, what you're really going to have to know if you become a psychology student is some statistics. And we'll talk about this in chapter two uh, when we talk about the scientific method. But we do certainly use math now to arrive at conclusions from our experiments, which is another part of psychology being a science. Um, and so you will, you know, a lot of psychology students say, oh, I love psychology. It's so interesting. But do I have to learn math? Yeah, you got to learn some math. It's basic algebra. It's nothing too complex. Multiplication, division, subtraction, squaring, square roots. That's about it. Um, but you will have to learn some, some mathematics uh, in the context of your statistics course. And in chapter two, we'll really explain why that's so important. Okay, so all this to say, psychology and, um, you know, math is there. It's in the background for sure. Uh, and it is, it was really important in the early days to get some traction and to get people to believe that, that psychology was worth pursuing as a science. Um, yeah, there's lecture one. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.